Today we are going to be in Matthew's, or I'm sorry, Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and uh, we're going to be looking at a story called the uh, Feeding of the 5,000. How many of you ever been to a potluck that they had 5,000 people? What a crowd that would have been, right? And probably more than that, as uh, that's just counting the men. So probably double, at least double the number when you count the spouses and then the children and everything else. What a crowd. But uh, interesting uh, fact about this story, this is the first and only miracle, and, it, and, it, and we do call it a miracle, because uh, Jesus miraculously fed more than 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and fish. And that, I don't know about you, but I would call that a miracle. And um, a little interesting fact about, about this, this is the first and only miracle that is recorded in all four gospel accounts. Now, most of us understand about how the gospels have been written. We call the first three gospels the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, synoptic being meaning that uh, they are similar, they give very similar accounts, they are in sync with each other very closely, uh, the, the events line up, timelines and everything else very, uh, very distinctly. John's gospel uh, is, is a different gospel, he gives a different account, different perspective and it doesn't always line up, the timeline and that type of thing. It doesn't always line up. So they always talk about the synoptic gospels being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then you have John's gospel that is unique in and of itself. But sometimes you do see and read about events that are in all four gospels. And uh, when you read those events and you find those events that are in all four gospels, that should give us some pause to say, hey, this must be important. Such things as the uh, suffering, the passion, and the death, and the resurrection of, of our Lord is in all four gospels. And uh, that, that is highly important. And so it is significant that this story this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, is in all four gospel accounts. And so it must have made an impression upon all the gospel writers that whenever they are writing their accounts, that they give thought to this story when Jesus fed more than 5,000 people. And just to give a kind of a brief sketch of the story, Jesus and his disciples have been very, very busy. They have been going from village to village, and they have been teaching, and they have been performing miracles. And, his, uh, and his, him and his disciples were going nonstop with very little room to rest or to eat. And at the center of all this activity, at the center of, at the, center of the story, is the undying compassion of Jesus. For the crowds. And it talks about in all four Gospels record the fact that when Jesus saw the crowds, they were busy, they were trying to get away, they were trying to take a break, but whenever they saw the crowds still coming, they just couldn't get away from the crowd. And yet every time Jesus would see them coming, it says he had compassion on them and he would just keep going a little bit more. Just when they thought they had a break, just when they thought they had time to take a breather, more people would show up. But because of Christ's undying compassion, he could not turn them away. And this, at the beginning of this scene, at the beginning of this story, Jesus, this is what takes place. He sees more. They're trying to get a rest. They're trying to get a break. But yet he still sees the crowds coming. And so Jesus spends the rest of the day teaching and ministering as he had been prior until finally his disciples put their foot down and they give this strong suggestion to their Lord that because of the lateness of the hour and the barren location that they were at, they were out in the desert, that maybe he should send the people away back to their homes so that they could get something to eat for themselves and get rested up. You see, up until this point, 
This seems to be the routine for Jesus and his disciples. Earlier in Mark's gospel, Jesus had given his disciples the authority to perform miracles and to preach repentance to the people. And the way that they were going, going from village to village, nonstop, you would, you, some might, some, this might send red flags up in some people's minds, uh, indicating that they are heading for a classic case of burnout, barely taking time to rest or to eat, always accommodating the ongoing needs of the crowds, very little opportunity to take a break. But Jesus ignores the recommendation to send the people home. But rather than continue on himself, he gives his disciples some directions. And he gives them the directions to take the leading role in feeding the masses and feeding the crowds. You give them something to eat. Why why would you send them away? You give them something to eat. A suggestion and a a word that was not received very enthusiastically. Ultimately, in the story, the people, at the end of the day, they get fed. And the people are so excited because they had been fed that according to John's gospel account of the story, the people wanted to force Jesus to become their king. They weren't going to wait around for him to reveal who he was. They were just going to simply take him and force him to be king, which I don't know how that would all work. But then also, an interesting note about Mark's gospel, and specifically about this story of the feeding of the 5,000. This story is the first and only time where the disciples are referred to as apostles in the entire gospel of Mark. This is the first and only time that you'll see the word apostles in Mark's gospel. What does apostle mean? Apostle means one who is sent. And so, we have this, this thing in Mark, and perhaps Mark he sees as a progression of purpose in the life of the followers of Jesus. First, Jesus calls forth his disciples to leave, a li- the, the, to leave their former life, to leave it behind in order that they might follow him. He gives them power and authority to basically do all that he was doing, the power to heal, the, the power to cast out demons and so forth. And now their new role and purpose is becoming more and more established as Jesus, seeing the end coming for him, seeing the day coming and drawing closer in which he will leave this world. It is at this story and it is at this miracle that the followers of Jesus in Mark's gospel are referred to as apostles, the ones who have been sent, the ones who are sent. What are we as Christians who follow the same pattern, who are followers of Christ? We are called to go. We we have been set apart that we might be sent out for our Lord and Savior, just like these disciples that we read about today. The question is, what are we sent to do? But beyond this point, the overtone of this story is is the significance behind the miracle itself, which is its basic and simple nature. Because up to this point, the disciples had performed more spectacular miracles, right? They had performed more spectacular miracles, such as healing the sick and the diseased, those who had skin diseases like leprosy, and being able to, to bring healing to them and seeing their skin clear up, or limbs perhaps growing back that had decayed and fall, fallen off because of leprosy. They had, they had cast out demonic spirits from those who were possessed, and so these are certainly ones that were eye-catching type healings and miracles, certainly more exciting sounding than merely passing out and handing out food. Nonetheless, however, there is tension found in the story because the disciples find themselves called to do a task that seemed to go beyond their capabilities. Or maybe, as we may see, 
beyond their expectations. And so when we look at the general tone of the story, as many people look at the story, we find this general tone and general lesson found in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. If you're taking notes, you could write this down. Your first point in your notes is that Jesus always wants trust and confidence in his ability to provide to be the way of life of his disciples. Jesus always wants trust and confidence in his ability to provide to be the way of life of his disciples. He is always putting his disciples in a corner where they have no choice but to believe. They're either going to abandon what they're called to do or they're going to follow through with what God has called them to do. They're going to have to trust and believe and be confident that God, Christ, is going to provide their needs. And some of us need to keep that in mind because if that is to be the way of life for each of us as followers of Christ, in what way... In what sense do we step out on a limb, so to speak, in how we follow Christ and how we follow God? If, if we find ourselves, if we find in our lives a life that really with just a little bit of common sense, hard work, and um, uh, patience, we don't have a problem living the life we do. Is that, would that characterize the overtone of your life? Yeah, just a little bit of common sense and hard work. Yeah, I get by. Because if that's the only, if that's the overtone of your life, then I wonder, are we truly following Christ? Are we following His purposes for our lives? Because when we look at the Scriptures, throughout the Scriptures, not even counting Mark's gospel, but throughout the entire Bible, the Old and the New Testament, time and time again, we're giving example after example after example where God's people, those who are following after God, who are seeking to follow His ways, are constantly being called to a situation, called to a way of life that will require absolute dependence upon God. And so that's an important lesson that this story teaches us. Jesus always wants trust and confidence in his ability to provide to be the way of life for his followers. And he says, and this is where the tension builds right in the midst of the story. Whenever Jesus tells his disciples after he, they encourage him to send the people away to go get something to eat. And he says this in verse 37, you give them something to eat. Why don't you give them something? Don't, why send them away? You feed them. Well, their response was not enthusiastic, to say the least. Why? Well, there are some obstacles to overcome. And we see some of those obstacles that were in the background of their response. In verse 35, if you're taking notes, there was the obstacle of the location. The location was bad. Where, where were they? They were out in the desert, weren't they? It says, so his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. Uh, the other gospel accounts use the word deserts. They were out in the middle of the desert. Have any of you been to the desert? Now, there's some beautiful scenes out in the desert. Whenever I was driving through the panhandle of Texas, I would say some of those areas were desert-like areas, but they were so barren. I mean, beautiful sights that you could see. I mean, the different colored rocks, but you know what? You can't really grow much in the desert. It's dry, dusty. They're out in the middle of the desert. You know, this is not, a, this is not a, the optimal location. Give them something to eat out here? There's no stores. Where are we going to go get food? But not only was the location bad, the timing was bad. The timing was, was bad in verse 35, and it's already very late. I mean, Lord, we've been doing this all day. We were doing it all day yesterday. We thought we were going to get a, a breather, but uh, then some more people came about, and, and we went the rest of the day. It, Lord, it's getting late. Uh, we don't even have time to prepare food. Send these people home. You know, 
isn't it good to know that we're not the only ones that give excuses for why we don't follow the Lord and what He calls us to do? The disciples had all kinds of reasons, and, and, and to common sense, right? To common sense, they weren't bad reasons. They made sense, right? It's getting, it's, we're out in the desert, it's getting late. But then there was the perceived lack of resources. There was the perceived lack of resources. I'm going a little bit quicker than what I normally do. I'm running through these, so tell me, raise your hand if you're having trouble writing these down or keeping up. It says in verse 37 and 38, they said to him, that would take eight months. This is after Jesus tells them to feed them. You know, they're out in the desert, it's getting late, it's bad timing, you feed them, and then they say, well, that would take eight months of a man's wages. I mean, they did a quick calculation of all the masses that they, that they could see and how much food they would have to buy. It would take up to eight months of a man's wages. Are we, are we to go spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? I mean, how many loaves do you have? He asked them. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. You see, I don't think it was so much that they didn't believe that Jesus could feed the people. I mean, after all, they had witnessed the the winds and the waves submit themselves to his commands. Whenever they were out in the boat and the storm had come and and Jesus said, be still, and they witnessed the wind and the waves cease and to calm. They had seen Jesus heal the sick. They had seen him cast out demons, even raise the dead. They had seen Jesus perform some incredible miracles. And so why this type of reaction? And as I began to look at this story, I began to see it a little bit of a different light. And I want to relate that to you this morning. Why did they have this type of reaction? I mean, whenever, how could they complain about the resources? How could they, they talk as if it was all up to them. As if they, they just completely forgot about who they were with, right? Right? They are with Christ, whom they've seen perform all these miracles. Well, you want us to do this? Well, Lord, that... And they act and talk as if that's an impossibility. They start calculating by man's reasonings, right? They, they start using man's math. Well, that take eight months of a man's wages. And they start thinking in, in proximity of man's abilities. Well, uh, you know, you know... You expect us to spend all this money, all this bread on all these people and just give it away? I I wonder if it wasn't for the fact that maybe they reacted this way because they didn't think it was necessary. Maybe the need wasn't urgent enough. Maybe the need wasn't urgent enough. Look again at verse 36. Send the people away so they can go. They're capable. They've got legs. They can go. Send them away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Makes sense. I mean, we're out in the middle of a desert. It's getting late. You stay out in the desert and you're hungry, you're, you're going to be pretty weak by the time the following day comes. Send the people away. It doesn't even cross their mind. Well, Lord, what do we do now? It's getting late. Uh, we're out in the desert. People are hungry. Rather than saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? There's a problem here. There's a circumstance. No, they're tired. They just want the crowds to go away and, uh, because this is something that they can do themselves. So far, the miracles of Jesus had been some incredible jaw-dropping miracles, and what Jesus did for people, they could not 
have done for themselves. All the things that Jesus had been doing for the people up to this point were things that they could not have done themselves. I mean, when Jesus went and healed the blind and opened their eyes, that wasn't, that wasn't within their power, the blind person's power to do that. They needed Jesus to do that for them. Whenever he called the lame, the crippled, to rise and walk, that was something that was completely out of that person's ability and power to do. All the things that Jesus was doing up to this point was doing things for people that could not help themselves. And I wonder if the disciples were fixated on the spectacular to such a degree that their hearts were closed to the seemingly lesser needs, such as hunger, especially those needs that they thought the people ought to be able to handle themselves, right? Lord, I mean, yeah, if this was something else, I mean, I'd say, yeah, we would would come expecting, well, this is, you know, do your thing, Lord, but oh, oh, they're just hungry, they're just tired. Oh, just send them away, Lord. That, I mean, they can help themselves with that, right? And I begin to ask and wonder, how often have we missed the opportunity to bless someone or to help someone because we assumed that they could handle things themselves? Or that the need that that they had wasn't all that serious to merit our time or my time. Oh, they can, they're fine. They can handle that themselves. Now, I have to admit that as a parent, I, uh, I'm guilty of this often. Um, and I don't know, and it wasn't so much with my first, with Caleb, uh, my first child, as it, now I'm really bad with uh, Della. Because now I, I hear, when Caleb was, was little and he would start crying, well, he's our first child, right? We'd hear him cry, oh, we'd come to him, and, and it didn't matter what the need was. It didn't matter what he was crying about. We would try to coddle him, and, and it's, oh, it's okay, buddy, it's okay. Now Della, she's crying, oh, you'll be fine. You'll get over it. Go play. Go on. <laughs> And it's like there's a callousness. I, you know, I'm being, I'm exaggerating, of course. But you know, we, we, I sometimes wonder if that isn't the way it is with us spiritually. We, we become cold-hearted toward the people's needs. And now, don't get me wrong. There are. The truth of the matter is, and if we're all real this morning, there are those in in our culture and society that they want to quote unquote milk things, and that's an unfortunate. That's an unfortunate, but I don't know if we're so much called to always try to decipher, are they milking this or is this a legitimate need and that type of thing. I think, I think it just requires, there's no cookie cutter way of doing it. I think it just requires the leading of the Spirit, and we have to be open to what the Spirit, and, and just trust that the Spirit will, will guide us and open our eyes to what is authentic and what is a farce. And, uh, but the question is, are we at least open to going down that road as far as opening ourselves to the leading of the Spirit, or do we just, have we just become so accustomed, oh, they'll be all right, oh, that problem, ah, uh, and, we, and we calculate in our mind, it's not really, is this really worth my time? And, and, and I'm afraid, at least in my own life, I've, I'm, I, I believe I'm probably guilty of doing that, where, oh, okay, because we're, we're so used to the big events going on in people's lives, and the big, quote-unquote, tragedies going on in people's lives, and we think, oh, okay, yeah, well, this demands my time, but for somebody over here that, oh, yeah, tough, that's too bad, but I, it looks like they could probably handle it, right? You understand what I'm getting at here? You understand what I'm saying? We become, we, we become so fixated on the spectacular or the magnificent things or tragedies or things that go on in people's lives that sometimes we can become blinded to the seemingly lesser needs because we assume that people can handle themselves. How often have we walked away after we checked the box, so to speak, after meeting a 
big need in somebody's life, or as a church, perhaps we, we might uh, help people out with their rent. Check the box. That's a big thing, and there's a big need in people's lives, or, or some other event where we help somebody, and, and, and we walk away checking the box, or maybe there's somebody that is uh, homeless that you, that, that's begging for something, money, or something like that. Well, you give the money, and you check the box, and you walk away. And we check that box, and we walk away feeling like we've accomplished something, but we walk away not realizing that inside there is a person that is broken, a person that is hurting, a person that is lost. We fail to look beneath the surface at a deeper issue going on in that person's life, a basic core need. And that's the next point in your notes. Jesus sends his followers to meet people at their core need. I believe that's an important aspect in this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. He sends his disciples, he calls his disciples to meet a core need in in the lives of those who were there that day. He says, you give them something to eat. You see, the people were hungry, right? They're hungry. Their stomach was growling like maybe some of your stomachs are growling right now. The people were hungry. Hunger is a basic human feeling that alerts us to one of our basic and core needs. We need food. Did you know that? Every human being needs food. There are... Only a few core needs, and I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but, but I could come up with at least three core needs that, that the human body needs to live. Food, water, and air, right? I mean, we don't even need clothes. Now, I'm thankful that we have clothes because we want clothes. But as far as for our biological system to be sustained, to function, to continue, for that heart to continue to beat, we need those three basic core needs, food, water, and the air. And if you, take, if you take one of those, any of those three needs away, you will die. Uh, you can go a little ways without food and water, but you'll eventually die quicker than you would if you had a regular diet of food and water. You take air away, you'll die within minutes. These are three core basic needs that we, that we need in order to live. A person's uh, body can be sustained through a lot of problems. Uh, a person can live with, with all kinds of handicaps and disabilities uh, as long as they have food, water, and air. And I think we often miss the truth, perhaps like the disciples that day, that sometimes the greatest needs of a person's life is their core needs. And this story seems to encompass a core need of the people being met in that they were hungry. And he says, you go and feed them. Now, when we look at Jesus and we look at his actions, it seems like his actions always seem to have and carry a deeper significance. If we get this, we capture this in John's gospel, in his gospel account of this story. It says in your notes, John chapter 6, beginning with verse 26, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, and this is whenever the people were looking for Jesus because of what he did for them. You're looking for me not because you saw the signs that I performed, these miracles, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're looking for me not because of the big spectacular miracles that, I, that I've been doing. You, this, speaking to this specific crowd, you are coming after me. You are following me because you had a core need met. I fulfilled that in your life. A core need was met. And then he tells them this in verse 27. He 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 takes it beyond the biological, beyond the surface need, and he gets deeper into 
a more complete picture of a person's life. Do not work for the food that spoils. That is the food, the bread, the actual bread and fish that I gave you earlier. Do not work. Do not make that the focal point of your life. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus tells, uh, it, it also says in Matthew uh, chapter 5, or 4 rather, whenever Jesus was uh, going through his desert temptations, uh, whenever Satan had, was tempting him with bread, when Jesus said, man will not and cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Acknowledging that man is more than biological mass and cells. Man, the complete man and woman, is not only the biological, but also the spiritual and the emotional. Jesus provided a physical need. He provided a physical core need. And the people were following him and coming after him because he fulfilled a core need. The question that I present in your notes this morning is, what are people hungry for? What are people hungry for? Because beyond the physical, what are the deeper hungers of the human heart? Because when these needs are met, when these basic core needs of the human heart are met, then endurance through any setback, through any handicap, through any tragedy in life is possible. But without these core needs being met, the soul will die much quicker. And so I leave you with a couple of core needs of the heart, of the human heart. What, what are people hungry for at the core of our being, at the core of our heart? First of all, if you're taking notes, it's a sense of purpose and meaning. We cannot exist spiritually, emotionally, just leaning on the fact that we're breathing and that our heart is beating. I mean, that is a core need for our physical lives. But life is more than just the physical. It is spiritual. And without the core needs of our spirit being met, we will ultimately die. And we need to have a sense of purpose. Why do we exist? Why am I here? Am I making a difference in life? It, whenever I die, will there be a void that will need to be filled? Will it, make, will, will it make any difference in, my, in this life, in this world, in my community, in my family, if all of a sudden I was gone? Would there be any difference in people's routines and people's lives? The Lord says in Jeremiah, through the prophet Jeremiah, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And then in 2 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Jesus told His disciples, you give them something to eat. Declare to people that the Lord and the God of this world has made each of us with a unique purpose and value. We saw a little bit of that this morning in some of you commending one another, appreciating, showing appreciation, instilling value. And when we instill value in people, it creates a sense of purpose. Hey, I must be making a difference, right? Go and feed. You go give them something to eat. 
apostles. You apostles, you are being sent for a reason. Go give them something to eat. Don't give me excuses. Go give them, you go give them something to eat. Go out and encourage people. Spread the news. Your life means something. It has meaning. It has value. You've been created for a distinct purpose. You are a God's special possession in order to declare His praises. And so, that is a core need of the human heart, that we have a sense of purpose and meaning. But then secondly and finally in closing, a sense of intimacy. A sense of intimacy. We need intimacy. Close relationships in our lives. If we are going to experience the abundant life that God has come to give us. He's, he says, I've come to, that you may have life but, and have it more abundantly. We need intimacy in our lives. I want to read you a section uh, from a book entitled A uh, Charitable Discourse by uh, Dan Boone. Uh, he is the uh, university president of Trevecca Nazarene University. And uh, this is in a section on uh, intimacy And the the chapter is on human sexuality. And he says, intimacy is a need. Do you remember, he writes, do you remember the movie they showed us when we were kids in school, Cypher in the Snow? Have any of you ever heard of that, Cypher in the Snow? Good. I never heard of it either. But hey, I'm just reading what he wrote in his book. But he tells about the story. It's a story of a child who rode the bus every day and then one day just died. They could find no cause of death. They examined his physical body. They could find no biological cause of why he would die. But when they began to unveil the pattern of the child's life, they found that no one ever touched, loved, spoke to, cared for, or called the child's name. It's a sad story about a child who died for a lack of intimacy. He writes, Boone writes, our world has confused sexual intercourse with intimacy. The entertaining world of stories such as books and TV and movies has led us to believe that intimacy leads to sexual activity. In every show you see it coming. You know when the characters are introduced that they will soon be in bed with each other. The mystery is gone. It's as predictable as the people we live with. When we automatically connect human intimacy with sexual behavior, we have bought into a script that is hard to extract ourselves from. If intimacy and sexual behavior are essentially one of the same, I suppose one of our favorite virgins, that is Jesus, must have lived a half-life. I would also suggest that another of our favorite virgins, Mother Teresa, missed the essence essence of life as a lonely, loveless, half-person. The idea of human intimacy is fulfilled only in sexual intercourse is a leap of disastrous proportions. Jesus, Mother Teresa, and a lot of my single adult friends are the most alive people I know. The need is not sexual intercourse It is intimacy, to be known, loved, touched, understood, and cared for. And in the context of what we are talking about, in the context of fulfilling the core needs of a person's soul and heart, intimacy is a must. People need to be cared for. They need to know that they are loved, that they are not rejected, that they are not outcast, sent out into the cold, that they are cared for, that they matter to other people, and particularly to God. And I love that story, and you've heard me read this story over and over again, but I'm going to read it again from the gospel account of, of, of Luke Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. 
He was the chief, a chief. He was the chief tax collector, the chief one who was despised more than all the, all the rest. He was the chief tax collector, which meant he was very wealthy because he cheated his countrymen. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, and they paid no mind to Zacchaeus. They weren't going to let him through. They were keeping him all onto the, on the outskirts of the crowd. They would not let him in. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Jesus starts with his name. I must stay at your house today. Jesus invites himself into the most intimate place, a person's home, at that, especially at that time. It was in the home that people ate together, which was a very intimate setting. You, when, typically when you would sit down to a meal, especially in this culture, it was a thing that was done between friends and loved ones who cared deeply for one another. For Jesus to call Zacchaeus by name. For Jesus to say, I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to where you live. I'm coming to you, Zacchaeus. I'm not going to invite you over just out of some because I feel obligated. Oh yeah, you can come, uh, yeah, yeah, you come over, you come over to, to my place on my terms. I'm coming to your place, Zacchaeus. And we are going to sit down together. And we are going to share a meal together. And we are going to have an intimate setting together. And so in verse 6, And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Already Zacchaeus' life is being changed. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount, which he was only required to pay back two times the amount if he, uh, if he was found cheating. He is going beyond the requirements to the overflow of his heart. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. He is a person that has value and purpose. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus instilled value and purpose and Zacchaeus was able to encounter intimacy. Jesus not only fed the crowds and and people loved him for it. They followed him. They wanted, him to, they wanted to make him king because they, he just simply filled their stomachs. Think about what people would do when they truly find in Christ that the, the one who is able to satisfy the hunger of their heart, the hunger of their soul. Do we want Jesus to be king? For Jesus gives us the ultimate intimacy when he says, when Paul says, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. We are thought of always, at all times. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus told his disciples, and he tells you and I today, you go give them something to eat. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this word that you have given to us, the challenge that you call us beyond the spectacular. You call us, Father, to strive to meet 
the core needs of a, of, of, of a human heart. The sense of purpose and meaning. The sense of intimacy. May, may we not forget that beyond the surface needs of the physical world, the physical body, let us not be so quick to check the box when we've done a good deed and we've satisfied a biological need. But may we look at the whole person and realize that there is a spirit, there is a heart that perhaps is hungry for truth, a heart that is hungry for wanting to know a sense of purpose and belonging. They're wondering, do I have any value? They're wondering, why do I exist? And they're longing for intimacy, for friendship, for somebody who cares about them. Lord Jesus, as we go this day, may we go with the mindset that you call us as a, to be apostles. You call us to go, to be sent with this message. And so, Lord, you are faithful. Help us to be faithful as well. We love you and we thank you. For it is in the name of Yeshua that we pray. And God's people said, Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and give you peace. Love one another. This day, you are dismissed. God bless you.